Thank you, everybody. Um, I know they drag everybody back from lunch, and uh, if you actually put your head outside, it's actually a beautiful day out. So I'm actually quite impressed that that many people have actually come back so early. So um, it's really nice to see. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not a Canadian. Um, okay, in my, in my face, what I vote right yes, I'm actually originally based out of Australia, um, and I was filtered out of the Australian park and moved over into Toronto. So um, it's a, a new experience um, dealing with minus 30 degrees compared to the lovely 30 degrees that we normally have in Australia. So um, I'd like to take you through the Toronto Hydro strategy of actually moving um, information technology and operational technology uh, going forward to actually allow uh, a harmonious migration into a, a smart grid world. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I live in North America, so I have to keep that up there. I'm really sorry to say it. I don't expect anybody to read it. Um, it's just a simple fact that I've, <laughs> I've got to put it up there. My legal people said I have to. I couldn't get away with it. Um, North America is a fun place to live, especially when you actually talk power systems, uh, networks, and security. It's, uh, it's an interesting place. But first, um, I'll quickly run you through who Toronto Hydro is. Um, we are the second largest municipal utility in North America. Uh, municipal utility means were actually owned by the city. Uh, to give you a quick understanding, in the North American market, uh, you actually got basically three types of utility. You actually have investor-owned utilities, municipal utilities, and state-owned municipal uh, state-owned utilities. Um, Municipal being done by the town or city, state by the state or province, and then best their own. So you probably have heard of Duke, um, PG&E, all of those. They're actually best their own. So they're actually have shareholders. Then you actually hear some of the other ones down in Texas. They're, they're usually actually owned by the state of Texas. And then you have a lot of the smaller utilities around the place which are actually done by just the town. Okay, we're a little bit different. Um, we're quite large, as you can tell. We've got over one and a half, or one point two million million customers. We have a, a base load of around five gigawatts, um, and actually have twenty percent of the Ontario load. Um, and if you want to realise where that is, is we were part of the two thousand and three outage um, that happened in the uh, eastern seaboard. Um, Toronto actually took them three days to get power back on to Toronto. So you can imagine 1.2 million customers without power for three days. It's not a pretty sell. Our network, uh, we actually have, and we're just awarded um, a smart, the Smart Rendering Installation of the Year in 2012 for our installation. Um, that is actually 98% of our customers actually have the media. Okay, it's a 705,000 meters there. Um, each high rise actually is only one customer and actually has, only has one meter. So there might be 400 customers behind that meter, but in the state, oh, sorry, in the province of Ontario, they just classify as one customer um, because they do sweep there. That's a historical legacy thing that we actually have to deal with. Uh, we actually have 60,000 transformers. Um, you can understand that's quite a few. But we've actually got more than 5,000 of those with monitoring. We actually have 12,000, uh, 1,200 things. We actually have 50 of those completely automated. I'm talking completely automated. So we actually have the FBIR, we actually have automated switching response, um, and they're actually showing up, we actually say, in five minutes and they say, yeah, you're working on those 50 things. So it's quite a, quite a substantial thing. Very expensive. We do actually have a fully a full DNS and OMS. Uh, being in North America, I won't give you what my bedroom is. Um, <laughs> and we actually have over 170 municipal substations. So we're talking uh, medium voltage or transmission voltage substations. Uh, and this is in an area that is probably one fifth the size of Singapore. Uh, so we have the highest density of customers. We've got more density than New York, and we actually have the highest development in North America for high rises. We actually have more than 180 on the go at the present moment in time. The high rise is 20 stories or more. 
New York has only got 72. So it gives you an understanding of our network growth as well as the development that happened in the at the present moment of time. So, what is on your channel? Anybody seen my honorary report? Tom Cruise walks through a shopping centre and all of a sudden his eyes actually getting flashed by advertising and the advertising is actually advertising directly at him. Omnichannel is the multi-approach done by retailers so actually get you to buy stuff. The same thing can be reversed. We can now talk. We're selling to you. How do we actually sell back? Good thing you actually have to break actual definition. <coughs> How do we actually keep track of the, of the customer by more than one channel? What is a customer? You've got to understand the utility actually has multiple components inside it. Every utility has multiple customers inside itself. Okay, I run I the operations department, so my, my customers are customers outside, but also asset management group, the IT group, VPs, the CEO, etc. etc. The reverse is, you know, IT, I'm a customer for IT. I'm a customer for the OT department. So when we actually went on to uh, Trent, the Toronto Hydro actually had a look at this. What was the best way that we actually interacted with each other, but also actually made a value proposition for the whole company? This is the next um, chunk we actually had to look at what we were doing externally from our company as well. Um, one of my friends uh, from, the, from one of the Texas utilities actually came up with the prosumer. Um, we've got the standard consumer, and you've got the prosumer, so someone who actually knows more about the product than you that you're trying to sell them. They know it back to you. So <coughs> how do we actually learn to sell power to, to our customers? We talk on the phone, we sometimes put an advert out. We then actually had a front desk that actually talked to the customer. We would send them a bill, usually through the post, and we gave them power. Then the internet came along, <coughs> made life a little bit more interesting. And then we actually hit Smart Grid back in 2003. Light bulb, very interesting. We now actually started to really interact with our customers. We actually actually now actually talk asking them to talk back to us. So then we bought in Facebook. And the utility say Facebook page. I know I don't. My utility has a Facebook page. Good. With having 700,000 meters, we now actually have one of the largest amounts of time we use. We talk constantly with our customers about common use. We will send out emails, we'll send out Twitter, we'll send out Facebook notifications that we're actually changing our common use. We actually change our common use constantly. Um, there was just a, recently we had a public holiday. In that public holiday, we actually changed our common use tariffs. So we actually told our customers, hey, we're changing our tariffs, just to let you know. Then we had mobile apps. Another thing to actually think about. Then there's Twitter. Um, if you'd like to know, I've been checking my Twitter constantly because I actually check what's actually, I actually know more about my network because we actually have a live Twitter feed coming out of our control room. So, we, so I was actually checking Twitter to see what my network was doing. Then we've actually started to look at distribution generation, sorry, distributed generation constant monitoring of those things because you don't monitor, monitor it, you don't understand it. You don't understand it, you're not actually getting the full picture of your network. Then you look at Wiki or Home Club or any of the other last mile components. They're actually starting to come in there as well. EVs, customers, look, we only just had um, the Toronto International Motor Show. They actually had a whole section of EV. I and mean, I'm talking not just a car or two cars. We actually had more than 20 vendors, more than 20 different cars selling EVs. If you, if you don't think they're coming, they are there. They are really coming along quickly. <coughs> I know where I went to the local ship deal. He actually has a vault. He said he was to chat with He said he's already sold more than a dozen of them. Our local um, upper crust um, style uh, department store actually gives free ballet parking for anybody with an EV. 
So our customers now are actually starting to think about these things. Uh, and then you've actually got um, distributed, uh, sorry, uh, grid response type things. Why I'm actually going through all this is because this is actually IT and OT. You can't think about them as just, this is IT, this is OT. We, uh, if you go through those, half of those things are actually supported by IT, the other half are supported by OT. If you don't think one or the other is actually there, you've got to, be, you've got to really start thinking about how you're actually interacting with those customers because me being the owner of OT, if I do something completely different to what my IT department does, we're now actually telling our customer two different things from the one company. And that really looks bad, especially when you're trying to actually give that great picture to those customers. So what actually does this actually mean? So we're now actually interacting with these customers now. So their expectation is now changing. So we're now engaging these customers on a minute by minute basis. If you don't believe me, go on to any utilities website. They'll actually have a, you know, please contact us. If you go to Con Ed, there's actually just updated their website, it's actually got a fully interactive storm page now. So you can actually see where the storm is, they actually overlay storm, they actually overlay where their crews are. So you actually think Encore is only done it as well. So our customers now expect you to be talking to them 24 by 7. They actually expect the response straight away. Good availability. They also expect it to be on 24 by 7. We're now actually starting to engage and talk with them and say, hey, we can make this route better. So they actually think that the route is always going to be there. I know it's not true, but they do. And then you actually think about the response. How quickly do we respond to them? These are all underpinned by both IT and OT. All of them. So we change the expectation of our customers. So we actually have to change the control. How do we actually control? We've got the AAT control center. Those control rooms will not exist in the next decade. You now actually have to integrate our IT in there, how our network works. I actually have an IT person permanently in my control room. They are there, okay, they might not sit physically next to the controller looking up the network, but he is there, he is in the control room facility, he is there to make sure that if the network goes down, I'm talking IT network, he's there to put it back on. He's there to make sure that our communication to our customers are always there. You then look at the customer engagement. I actually have, as I said, a direct Twitter feed coming out of the control room. During the hour, we normally have a media representative sitting in our control room doing live web webcasts out of the control room. We're now engaging our customers on a continuous basis. If they don't have the information from the control room, where are they going to get it? AMI, as I said, we've got one of the largest AMI networks out, out there. And we actually have that now live in our control room. We actually can interact with every single minute, every single minute. When we do, we constantly do. Uh, to be honest, we had a storm last night, which was yesterday for us, time frame. Um, <laughs> but we actually were able to optimise our crew response because when the customer called in and said that they had no power, we actually had an outage. We actually interacted with those meters to confirm that our outage was true. We were actually able to optimise our response. We only actually had to roll seven crews. That was it. We only rolled seven crews for a storm. We only had one extra supervisor come into the control room to actually help. So our normal complement was there to able to underpin and actually work with the technology that we had to actually do it. But if you don't do that without an IT and OT convergence, it makes it very difficult because you know, your left hand is not speaking to your right hand. EV. Um, look, EV will be there. Um, if you want to know, if you've ever called and had a great look at an EV, every single EV actually has a SIM card in it. Every EV is actually constantly streaming data out there. 
where does that data go? Currently it goes to whoever the people that control the universe. That should be something, well, it will be something that the control room on the utility will actually be looking at. Because if they know where the EV is, they know where the charge is more than likely going to be actually going onto the network. And the reverse is if there are EVs around, they now know where it is, they can actually say, oh, I want to actually get that power to come back into the network. So when you think about it, EVs are going to be another kind of a control room to think about. Uh, demand response. Um, I was talking with a group over in the Oklahoma, and it was actually quite entertaining. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows them or not. Uh, they're a demand response company. They actually sell actually on the transmission side of things. So they go over to all the customers and say, you know, can you actually respond to a demand call? I'll pay you money for that. What happened to poor old Oklahoma is they've actually got Ananoc in there, they've actually come along, Ananoc actually sells that demand response to the transmission side, and unfortunately the distributor in between doesn't see either. So all of a sudden they see you know, 50 megawatts just disappear off their network because the transmission needs the 50 megawatts off the network, and all of a sudden the poor old um, distributor is actually sitting there going, oh my network's falling down, what's going on? So the understanding that this demand response actually needs to be part of the control room is very much there, which is another IT for you. And then you've got distributed generation. Um, look, you know, that's going to be there and we've got to be monitored. But how do you monitor it? Because what is distribution generation? Is it an IT function or is it an OT function? So with that, you've got to actually change how you think of communication. Is it an IT thing or is it an OT thing? Is it scalar or is it network? So what are we here at Toronto High Rise to actually think about? We just said, well, we're a utility. There's no IT, there's no OT. We're a utility. We service and get data from point A to point B. So we looked at it as the utility. Network response. What is the criteria? What is the requirements for a network response? And we actually wrote down the specifications of that. We then looked at the economic response. How do we actually respond to it economically? Is it actually a financially viable thing to do? Because we've got to understand there's a lot of economics that come in around having EVs on your network because there's a lot of money involved. Distribution generation, a lot of money involved. Um, the Ontario government actually has the feed-in tariff plan, which is worth something like $500 million. There's a lot of money. If we cannot actually support half a billion dollar investment, how do we actually you know, justify that investment from the government? And then we actually look at low response. How do we actually respond to that? So we actually look to have pre-moody specifications around each type of response that we actually need for the utility. And then lastly is the customer. How do we actually make sure that we are actually respond efficiently to the customer on an IT and an OT basis? So we changed our complete idea that was how we used to look at it, IT and scale. We actually doubled up on a lot of things. As you can see, we actually had stuff on both sides. We had software on both sides. We had hardware on both sides. We had different architecture on both sides. We doubled up on a lot of things. We said, well, this is pretty stupid. So we actually what we thought about it. We said, let's remove that scale and let's remove that IT. Let's remove my side and your side. And we said, what's critical? What's even significant? Basically, we turned around and said, real time and any time. What can we do now? What can be done at any time? Any time still could be real time, but it's any time. So we said, that's on that side, that's on this side. We're not talking IT, we're not talking OT. And we said, well, architecture, so that touches both sides. That's right. So we said, let's have an architecture team. And we've actually got a, a very lucky pickup, someone from the IT, from the, um, from the Telcos, he actually came in from Silicon Valley, has a great IT background, a great networks background, so he actually is getting up our architecture team. So we've actually got a specific team just looking at architecture, architecture on an IT and an OT basis. We then went to hardware. Well, hardware is like any time, but it's defined under the architecture. So we did then, we then argued, well, do we need this switch for this type? Do we need this switch for this type? So we actually set the specifications. We didn't care who the vendor was, as long as they met the specifications. The vendor is insignificant. Specification was insignificant. I'm, I'm. And then we went, well, 
with stopping. We need stopping in a real time basis. Constellation could stop any time in that period. And then we have more communication. How do we actually communicate? We need that both sides. It can be any time, it can be real time. So basically, that was where we converged IT and OT together. We actually started using our IT infrastructure for stable communications. Okay, we, security was another thing which we talked about, and security was a component of software. So we then put in our software component to make sure that our scatter could stay away from our IT and we met all our MERG requirements um, because we live in the North America, we actually have to live in the, the lovely thing, trust me. You don't want to wish it on your worst enemy. Um, great fun, great night of reading if anybody wants to. I can send you a copy of it. It's really great reading. But we actually then actually sat back and went, well, what do we really need to do? So I'll go through you guys. Control function real time, and then storage is another thing. Um, to understand, we actually had to put in a complete data center. Um, storage wise, the 700 smart meters, we're talking, we haven't even gigabytes yet, but we're in substantial terabytes of data. And we've only been doing it for a couple of years. So when you do look in terms of gigabytes, yes, it is a true statement. Gigabytes do exist, and yes, they will be around. Um, and then we look at maintenance and then response. So we turned around and said, well, we had to look at this as a way of actually how do we manage it now. I gave up this theory. I didn't give up scatter. Scatter still exists. But they are the ones specifying. They don't own it. They specify. We have IT or we just have a technology group. And they're they will be implementers of the specifications. So when we actually look at the direct application, we turned around and said, well, what do we really need? So we 